we all love in third season? What would what would be the role now in, in the third, third season? season? Um, well, Rollo, um, yeah, we all know that he betrayed his brother in, in the first episode of season two, and he spends the most of season two trying to make amends and build that relationship. So we join him in season three, and, and you know, Ragnar has taken him back. He makes that deal with Egbert um, after Rollo is trampled on by the horses to bring him back. Um, so he realizes that his his anger and frustration is is misplaced on his brother. But he's still not happy. He still has this burning ambition to, to, to do something more, to be greater, to make a name for himself. He, um, and he's not going to find that living in Kattegat um, as a shell of himself. He's almost forgotten who he is. He's tried so hard to, to be who he, he thinks people want him to be that he's lost root of you know, he's lost his roots. Um, so it's going to be an interesting uh, arc for Rollo this season. I think he realizes that. You know, build, there's going to be something happen with Siggy um, um, in their relationship that, that hits him from left field, and everything, all of his past misdemeanors, all of his past wrongs, um, all come back to haunt him in the same day. And I think after that episode, around mid-season, you see almost a new Rollo, a, a Rollo mm -hmm. that's been reborn, and um, and it sets him on a completely different path. And I think maybe his destiny, or he thinks his destiny, may lie in in Paris, because we go to Paris in season three, and um, Paris is, is unlike anything that we've, um, we've we, we associate with the city today. It's an um, impenetrable fortress in the middle of the River Seine, um, and the Vikings have never seen anything like it either. Um, they have siege, anti-siege weapons. They have um, ways of keeping the Vikings out of the walls, and it's going to be a huge mountain to climb for Ragnar, Rollo, Floki, and, and the rest of the Vikings if they're ever going to see what it's like inside past the gates. Um, but Rollo is, is, is excited about this raid because he has knowledge that maybe this is a new, this is his calling card, this is somewhere where he can prove and make his mm -hmm. name. Um, so yeah, um, the, the season builds and builds and builds and our big climactic episodes are, are in Paris and we're so proud of some of the episodes and, and some of the, the action that we have in season three because we really push the boat out, if you pardon the pun. Um, to, to really do something special and I think what we achieved is, is mind-blowing. There's, there's a particular episode, I think it's episode 8, which is almost action from start to finish. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually a you know, through line through the battle. You get to see you know, from the beginnings of, 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 of launching off of the boats to, to the siege and we have siege towers and, and getting inside Paris and or, or, try, or trying to get inside Paris uh, is, is exciting. Just, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible episode. How this all starts for you? When I was uh, on the set, Michael first told us about uh, casting of uh, Travis, casting of this tape, ca uh, casting of Kathleen. How was with you? I am. Um, my very first audition was to to I auditioned to play Rollo, um, but Rollo was a very different character. He was written to be a lot older, and he was the cousin of, of Ragnar, because the one. A uh, bit of artistic license that Michael took was that, that Rollo and Ragnar were never brothers in real life. They lived a hundred years apart, um, and he made them brothers so he could tell both of these epic stories within the same time frame. Um, so I auditioned for Rollo, and they very quickly went, "Well, you're more of a Ragnar." And I went on this journey of auditioning for Ragnar, and then they found their Ragnar. And um, you know, I, I like to think that I must have done something right because Michael changed the character and made him younger and made him the brother, um, and. And it's been great. So uh, that's the, it was a weird journey to get start the role, go around the round robin of auditioning to play Ragnar, and then end up exactly with the character that I started with. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen, um, much of Kathleen um, practice is on Facebook, is on the um, internet. Uh, he, she made film yeah. about this. Uh, what like? What is your practice? I mean, you mean the, the, the stunt practice you've yes. got there? Well, I like to keep it all a secret because I'm not a big fan of spoilers and I just think um, I like to kind of, I don't show off about the battle scenes. I think you should, you, sometimes when you show too much behind the scenes of that kind of thing, I think you kind of ruin the magic of the show. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the audience think they want to know how it's made and how it's put together, but I think you should see it when it's all cut together so you see this, this you know, visceral, um, almost, you know, fantastical battle scenes with, hundreds of stuntmen and things that you, know, you don't want to see how it was put together, you just want to, to lose yourself in mm -hmm. this drama, so I don't tend to do things like that. Um, but you can talk about it. Yeah. You're master of Thai box, 
you have experience with swords uh, in Robin Hood, in uh, in Camelot. Yeah. Uh, how this helps uh, it does in this show? Martial arts in general helps when you're learning the, the fight choreography because you have a sense of yourself and your spatial awareness. And also when we are choreographing the fights with our stunt coordinators, you tend to it tends to be more organic. You don't just make up moves for the sake of making up moves. You, you you place a move and then you can automatically see where the opening would be and the natural target point. So you, you end up kind of being able to grasp the choreography a lot quicker because it just makes sense. You know, I hit, I hit you here and you block there and, mm -hmm. and then well, what would be the most natural move? I'd come around and go for your neck or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, it helps like that. Um, and you know, I did a lot of sword work when I was younger, I suppose, and it's like when you're a kid and you learn to play the guitar or the piano when you're young and when you're an adult you can just pick it up and play. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you try and learn as an adult, it's such a massive uphill learning curve that you kind of just don't bother. Um, and I only noticed that when we had guest artists coming in and, and they get some choreography to do and they find it very hard to get, to, you know, it takes them a lot longer to pick it up. And I pick it up so quickly now that it's only when I have something to compare it to and I go, oh, something just gels, it's just in my muscle memory. Um, so I'm lucky like that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, the thing is with, with the choreography that we do is that our stunt coordinators, Richard Ryan and, and Franklin Henson, they, they teach us the choreography, they work with us tirelessly and we, we learn, we learn, repeat, repeat. Um, and then we're encouraged to kind of just let it go. Because if you want to really get the fear and, 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 the, and that sense that at any moment, you know, the character you're watching on screen, is, is in jeopardy for his life, you kind of almost need to just trust that that choreography will come back when you need it. So you're kind of almost encouraged to, to forget it. And sometimes accidents happen, sometimes we get shields in the face, it's not going to happen, but it just adds to the drama because it makes it slightly more gritty and real. Um, and I, th I think that's a, it's, it's a great way to go. I mean, it's you know, at the very last minute, you just trust that you're going to block that, that weapon because you put so much work into to the rehearsals. Um, you know, sometimes the choreography you learn on your feet in the stunt room you're out in the field, slipping all over the floor, and rolling in the dirt, and you're just trying to get back on your feet, and, and you keep the choreography going, and, and, and it adds to you know, adds to a little bit more excitement for the viewer. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the art. Uh, this show is very authentic. How um, how dear to you must be every day on the set? A dirty, yeah. I mean, some sometimes um, with Travis Fimmel and myself, we annoy the costume department because they. Uh, at the beginning of the week on a Monday, they've obviously washed your costume and it's all come back and clean and we'll just get down on the ground and start rolling in the mud just to make it feel a little bit more like we've been you know, on, a, on a boat for three weeks and haven't had a wash. And they're running after us to get really annoyed with us and um, it, you know, we're, we're, we're quite naughty like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where at the end of the day you kind of sometimes have to get all the blood and the mud out of your hair and your, you know, out of your ears and, and you, you, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in our private lives, you know, going out for a meal afterwards as a cast and you've still got blood in your nose and in your ear or hidden behind your neck and you wonder why the waitress is staring at you like you've just murdered someone outside. And, um, but it, is, it just comes part and parcel with the, with the show. And it's a show called Vikings, it does exactly what it says on the tin. So if you yeah. uh, I was uh, on the set that this was, you have this village, uh, you have Catacomb. Yes, you have a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of um, things from, from a magazine of things. Uh, uh, this help, did help uh, in, in playing. Um, yeah, well it's it's kind of sometimes you feel like it's it's no acting required. You just turn up to the set and everything's just there for you. Um, you know, they're, they're some of the extras that we use now have been doing it for so many years. I mean, they've been with us for four years now, and um, you know they can be blacksmiths and farmers and, and market traders and things, and they just bring the whole world to life. So you walk on and you just just there. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, you know. And you're in a theatre show, and the audience are in the darkness, and you and you you it's, you have to play make believe quite a lot. And in, in Vikings, we're lucky enough to actually feel like we have the closest thing to a living, breathing Viking market. Your place in a, a town. It's amazing. Your show <coughs> is. Uh, mm, many people think and mm, talk about this and Game of Game of Thrones, like yeah, yeah like competition. What do you think about it? I don't think there's any. I love Game of Thrones. There's no competition there. The the big difference is that um, I think Vikings almost appeals to a far bigger demographic in terms of 
Game of Thrones is a fantasy show, an out and out fantasy show. It's just the imagination of one writer, George R. R. Martin, um, and it has an audience for that that, 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 that love that, that kind of genre. And just as certain period dramas are almost made under the same formula, and, and I understand why. I mean, don't try and fix what's not broken. You've got Downton Abbey and new ones, Poldark and Pride and Prejudice, and, and they just have this formula for making period dramas. And Vikings is a historical drama, but it breaks that mold completely because the gods and the belief system that the Vikings uh, lived by is almost fantastical. It does look like Game of Thrones. They believed in you know a serpent that would bite its own tail and wrap itself around the world, and you know, Jormungast, and you know, Fenrir the wolf that would swallow the sun, and Ragnarok, the end of all things, and, and it is somehow connected within that world. But that's what they really believed in. Um, and then you've got the Vikings' um, mentality and, and just the things that they, they did is full of action and adventure and, and, you know, and intrigue. And so therefore you encapsulate another broader demographic of people that want to see a bit of that. Then you've got strong women. You've got, you know, it's not just a male heavy show where it's just about men watching men be alpha males. You've got these women that are so well written by Michael Hurst that they're not just fluff to, to um, to add to the male storylines or anything, they have, you know, they're amazing storylines. That I look at these women in, in Vikings and I see my mum, my my wife, my daughter. There's, they're real women. They're not badly two-dimensional written women that so many American writers get away with these days. So you've got that as well. And I just think it, it's just got such a, a, a broad demographic that people we didn't even know that the, the people that are watching this show would be interested in. It's kind of encapsulated people. Um, and right down at the, the heart of it with this, the backdrop of having, you know, this world where it's kill or be killed and these fantastical um, gods and, um, and these landscapes that we film and it's, 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 it's event television at its best, but right down, deep down at the heart of Vikings is just a family drama. You know, history has, ch has changed mm -hmm. through centuries, through centuries, the way we live today has changed, our politics have changed, and, but human beings haven't really changed. Um, you know, we still are driven by greed and power and love and lust and um, we still we all love our children and it is just a man and his, and his wife and his children and his uncle uh, uh, sorry and his brother their uncle trying to make good in, a, in this this backdrop mm -hmm. and I think it's I want so proud to be about it. I want to ask you uh, about your other experience uh, mm, for example you were in Bollywood films <laughs> yeah, many, many moons ago. It was uh, different? It was a great experience. It was, um, it was a real um, experience. Of, we filmed half of it in, in the UK and half of it in India. And, uh, and just seeing how, how different that world is out there in Bollywood. It's like being in the 1950s Hollywood. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very different. And, um, but yeah, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And um, I, kind of, I, I got no regrets about doing it. I learned a lot. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I was I was never asked to do any of the Bollywood dancing, so I got off quite lightly. <laughs> but it was it was amazing to work with some of these Bollywood stars. You are the equivalents of, of, of the guys that we all um, watch in our, on, our in, the, in the mainstream American cinema. They have the equivalent of Tom Cruise and Keira Knightley, and, um, and seeing how how, how different uh, that world is out there. Um, it was great. It was a great experience. But it was a long time ago. Oh, I was like 19 years old. Something like that. And you played uh, in my favorite TV show, Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> How you remember this? Oh, it's great. Like, well, like? I'm, a, I'm a big Doctor Who fan, and, and um, I just finished doing a, a, a film for Sony Pictures called Patient Zero, and I worked with Matt Smith in mm. that. So now I've worked with two different doctors, because when I was in Doctor Who, I worked with David Tennant, and, um, and now I work with Matt as well. Uh, yeah, Doctor Who's great. You know that family, um, uh, meaning the, the you know the crew and the producers. They really do look after everyone in Doctor Who, and it's just such a great set to be around. You know, I did my three episodes, and I had my small part in, in this this massive juggernaut of a show, and I got treated like I was one of the team, and really felt welcomed. And it's just it's one of that's why I think every actor that is, that works in the UK kind of it loves to kind of you know to be a part of it because it has become part of like this. This um, this almost legacy in, in, in UK to TV drama that you know that used to be cop dramas and things like that. Now actors are kind of like you're, you're not you're not really an actor unless you've been doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you think sometimes about back Peter Capaldi's back. Mm. <laughs> yeah, uh, I haven't seen any of um, Peter's um, Doctor Who. I've just been so busy with work. I think my kids have watched some of it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I'd be interested to see what he does. I've not been able to watch any of that season at all. And this is my last question. Uh, what is your favourite uh, TV show? My favourite TV show? They change all the time. Right now, I'm loving Fargo. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, you know, I didn't really know much about it. I'd seen the film and, and that was the first drama in a while where I'd watched like, five episodes in a row and just couldn't stop until <laughs> I was falling asleep. And the House of Cards, I love. Um, I'm a big fan of The Walking Dead as well. I mean, I've watched every episode of that. Um, I, just, I haven't really seen anything new lately. I'm not sure what's around at the moment, but um, yeah, I'm looking for a new TV show mm -hmm. to watch. Um, I'd like to check out Peaky Blinders as well. That looks quite good. Um, but yeah, if I was to choose one, Fargo right now, it's just it was incredible. Are you waiting for the second season? Yeah, um, and I've, I have no idea what they're going to do with it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's I just love having a, a show where they automatically the characters just surprise you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Martin Freeman in, in Fargo was fantastic casting. You think of him in the office and you expect him to be one person and then without giving spoilers away for people that haven't seen Fargo, but very quickly in that episode when he picks up a hammer and you just go, Whoa, all bets are off and that's you know, that's what we all act for as actors. We like to we never like to get pigeonholed or typecast and I love dramas where